Most of you aren't subscribed. Make sure to subscribe, as it helps out the channel. Without further ado, the series kicks off at the dead of night, with a mysterious lady supposedly slaying our MC, Tomokui Kanata, who is unable to stop his own death. Upon opening his eyes, our MC spots an elder goblin in front of him, hearing the old goblin give our MC the name of Gobru. As the elder goblin force feeds Gobru some insects, Gobru falls asleep, waking up the next day, only to spot several other baby goblins around him, helplessly crying. Another day has passed, and Gobru is surprised that goblins mature so fast, heading out towards the sunlight as various other goblins watch. With the fourth day arriving, the elder goblin states that this will be the last meal they will receive, as they will have to hunt for their own food moving forward. As Gobru savors the delicious grubs, Gobru once again heads towards the light, amazed to be in the middle of a forest where mysterious birds fly in the sky, along with the various unknown plants that surround their home. Gobru greets a fellow goblin, Gobkichi, purposely teaming up with one of the more athletic goblins to hunt down their next meal together. As Gobkichi scares a horned rabbit towards Gobru, Gobru manages to knock out the rabbit, but catches Gobkichi trying to eat without him, disciplining Gobkichi. As Gobru extracts the horn from the rabbit, he suddenly hears a voice in his head, brushing the voice aside, as Gobkichi and Gobru finally feast on the rabbit's flesh. With the fifth day arriving, the duo repeat the hunting process, but Gobru manages to make use of the previous rabbit's horn to slay another rabbit. Once again, Gobru hears a strange voice in his head, but once again brushes it aside, feasting on their prey. Just then, Gobru is notified that he has learned the skill escape, realizing that he has the skill to absorb the traits of anything he eats, just like how he did in his previous life. As the two continue to hunt more food, Gobru notes how none of his skills carried on from his previous life, but is perfectly fine, as there are plenty of monsters in the forest. On day 6, the other goblins learn of Gobkichi and Gobru's success hunting horned rabbits, with Gobmi in particular revealing that a goblin brethren was slain by a horned rabbit the other day. Seeing as Gobmi is so amazed at Gobru's success hunting, Gobru offers Gobmi to join them hunting the next day, earning him a big hug from Gobmi. Sadly due to it raining, Gobru postpones their next hunt, heading deeper into their cave's storage room to search for weapons. Upon spotting in particular, Gobru heads back outside beginning to craft a weapon, but reveals that he had seen some captured human women inside a storage room, not wanting to think about their reason for being there. Just then, the elder goblin Gobji approaches, telling Gobru that he'll level up pretty fast, revealing that Gobru can see his level by tapping his head. Apparently Gobji is level 86, adding that upon hitting level 100 a goblin can evolve into a hobgoblin, but utters that goblins normally age too quickly to even reach such a feat as Gobji himself has only been alive for 20 years. As he leaves, he states that a fellow hobgoblin should be returning from a nearby village soon, creepily grinning at what prey the hobgoblin will bring home. On day 8, Gobmi is seen assisting the hunt by attacking from long range, all whilst Gobru focuses on attacking mid-range prey, only for Gobkichi to deal with any prey at close range. As the trio enjoy their spoils from the hunt, Gobru is notified that he has learned the skills, Thermography, Venom, Venom Resistance, Search and Evil Eye. Throughout the ninth and 10th day, the trio continued to hunt and feast, but on the 11th, the gang accidentally stumbled into a cave with hundreds of bats. As Gobru orders Gobmi to flee, Gobkichi holds up a shield for Gobru, allowing Gobru to active his Evil Eye skill, freezing the bats in place, allowing the gang to slay the bats. Gobru acquires Echolocation, Vamp Up and Veemphilia, from eating the bats, but at the same time, fellow goblins jealously watch from afar. That night, several goblins wake up in the middle of the night to attack Gobru, but having had his search skill active, Gobru attacks the six goblins with his horn, but when Gobmi found out they were attacking Gobru, she mercilessly put the goblins to sleep. On the thirteenth day, our trio faced an orc, forced to disarm the orc first, only to deal the finishing blow. Acquiring libido, orc language, detect analyze from the orc, Gobru reasons he should share his food with the other goblins, noting that he has definitely changed from his previous life, as he would have never helped the weak in his previous life. That night, Gobru receives various messages, telling Gobru that he has met the conditions to evolve, but not wanting to waste his precious sleep, Gobru simply agrees to evolve, heading back to sleep. 
On day 14, Gobru wakes up, shocked to see his new body, but is even more amazed to see that his face resembles his previous life's. Seeing Gobkichi has evolved as well, Gobmi is ecstatic for them, impressing Gobji as it has only been a month since they were born. Seeing as both are excited to test out their new bodies, they both agree to a duel, both heading outside to spar. As Gobkichi throws the first punch, Gobru nonchalantly blocks the strike, both trading blows, only for Gobru to slip Gobkichi's next punch, only to trip Gobkichi, making Gobru the winner. They both acknowledge how far they've grown, but suddenly they both hear loud cries off in the distance, prompting Gobru to call for Gobmi to reveal herself, asking Gobmi to grab her crossbow. Out on a large field, we see various horned rabbits being devoured by a pack of wolves, even managing to slay an orc flawlessly. With Gobru and Gobkichi in position, Gobru signals for Gobmi to fire the first shot directly at the pack leader, drawing the wolves' attention, only for Gobru and Gobkichi to begin slaying the wolves, with the pack leader running off. Our trio are able to easily dismantle the pack of wolves, but as things wrap up, Gobru is confronted by the wolves' leader, but luckily the leader drops dead due to blood loss. Devouring the leader, Gobru obtains wild hunt, hide armor and order, making use of it to become a leader. As Gobru brings back the wolves to feed the rest of the goblins, Gobru states that he expects to be repaid, prompting the fellow goblins to beg Gobru to train them how to hunt. With Gobru gladly offering to train them, the fellow goblins begin chanting and praising Gobru, giving Gobru a clear idea of what he needs to do moving forward. Gobru states that he plans to train his fellow goblins, all whilst devouring more skills himself, but as day 17 arrives, Gobru is seen exhausted with the amount of work he has on his plate. Upon heading back home, Gobru spots Gobmi has finally evolved. Later that day, both Gobru and Gobji pray for the deaths of the captured human women, as they had chosen to take their own lives with a poison. With day 26 already arriving, Gobru continues to train the other goblins, scolding Gob for trailing behind, but also notes that he himself has been devouring and stealing skills from more monsters in the forest. Just then, Gobru senses several beings approaching, readying his blade to slay them, but Gobji intervenes, revealing that they are allies. Seeing the various hobgoblins, Gobru watches as Gobji greets Hobkin, praising the Hobkin for capturing more women. Gobru reveals that goblin DNA can override human DNA, therefore when human and goblins mate, the children birthed will ultimately be a goblin. Unable to stand the sight of the petrified women, Gobru asks if he can take care of the captured women, but Hobkin gets pissed, grabbing Gobru by the collar. Seeing this, both Gobru and Hobkin's armies prepare to fight, but just then Hobzato and Hobsay the mage defuse the situation. As a compromise, Hobzato suggests that Gobru and Hobkin duel for the right to rule, but Gobru is easily able to defeat Hobkin, having used a web skill to restrain Hobkin. With Gobji and the others surprised that Gobru was hiding such a skill, Gobru declares that he'll decide the fate of the human women, secretly telling the girls that he'll take care of the girls and if they behave he'll allow them to return to their village. In exchange for their safety, the women reveal that they were part of a traveling business, but were unfortunately attacked, being the only women that survived, which haunts them still. The next day, Gobru arrives with food, learning that humans can't evolve like goblins and instead obtain special jobs. The short brown hair is an appraiser and a smith, the two blonde sisters are cooks and tailors. The green hair seems to be an alchemist and the red hair seems to be a rookie warrior. Heading back to train his goblin army, Gobru has Hobkin's men train with his army, scolding the cocky goblins for acting all tough, reasoning that they should continue focusing on training before hunting. On day 31, since it was raining, Gobru and Gobkichi put on a show, shocking everyone as they watched the boys move. That night whilst everyone sleeps, Hobkin and his men begin approaching the human women's, but before Hobkin can lay his hands on them, Gobru intervenes, beating and tying the men up. Before Hobkin can spout more of his nonsense, Gobru kicks Hobkin, apologizing to the girls that break down crying. With Gobkichi and some others waking from the commotion, Gobru orders Hobkin and his men to be dragged outside, publicly executing Hobkin and his men's, only to calmly ask if everyone understood the rules. On day 32, Gobru and his party finally begin hunting again, running into a tri-horned horse, which has tough scales. Gobru is forced to tie up the horse, giving them an opening to dismantle and slay the horse. 
From the horse, Gobru learns the skills, scale drive, scaled horses cry, quick healing, kick proficiency, pierce, proficiency up and triple thrust. A skill that allows Gobru to deal three times the normal damage. That night, Gobru is woken up by the red-haired girl sharing a bed with him, feeling bad as the red head must have been scared. Surprisingly on day 33, Gobru awoke with the redhead and Gobni sleeping beside him, rushing out of bed only to learn that Gob had evolved into a hobgoblin, having been carrying his party's gear during hunts. Reviewing his army's progress, Gobkichi is captain of the armored fighters, Gobni mounts the ranged unit, Hobzato handles mobile goblins, Gob leads the rear support and Hobse is the village's lone mage. Seeing as everything at base is running smoothly, Gobru heads deeper into the forest to explore, running into another tri-horned horse. Conjuring a dark magic spell, Guy Derg, Gobru propels the spell at the horse, instantly decapitating it. Shocked at how strong he is, Gobru heads deeper north, spotting a trail of blood, only to remember that Gobji had warned the goblins of a powerful crimson bear that lived north of the forest. Just then the crimson bear appears, sending shivers through Gobru's body, but even though he knows he should run, Gobru gets excited at getting to fight and consumes such a monstrous creature. Getting serious, Gobru conjures his dark magic spell once more, dual wielding his axe and shield, only to engage the bear. Back at base, Gobmi worries that Gobru is staying out too late, prompting Gob to ask around, reporting that the others have yet to see Gobru since this morning. As Gobru fires his spell, Gobru is shocked to see the Crimson Bear sacrifice its arm, to prevent a lethal blow. Going on the offense, the bear begins cleaving his surroundings with its claw, something Gobru knows he should avoid at all cost. Seeing an opening, Gobru leaps forward to decapitate the bear, but his axe barely cuts the bear's skin, leaping back. Trying a different tactic, Gobru makes use of his silk to restrain the bear, but out of nowhere, the crimson bear unleashes a breath of flames, consuming the surrounding forest with fire. As the bear slowly walks away, Gobru is revealed to have evaded the explosion, slowly regenerating his wounds. Knowing that he'll have to get in close, Gobru reveals himself, taunting the bear to unleash its breath of fire once more. Casting a barrier, Gobru dashes towards the bear's mouth, puncturing the inside of the bear's mouth, but sadly the bear uses the opportunity to land a powerful swipe, sending Gobru flying. Having barely survived, Gobru notes that his blade is preventing the bear from breathing more fire, revealing that he'll surely die if he gets struck again. But upon seeing the bear's determination, Gobru rushes towards the bear, evading its initial slash, leaping into air, only to pierce the bear's neck from behind. Seeing that the bear is now pissed, Gobru takes advantage of the bear's sporadic movements, both rushing towards each other. With day 34 arriving, Gobru sits alone having won the duel, but has received a fatal blow from the bear. Devouring the bear meat, Gobru obtains the skill's heavy damage, overpowering strength, but slowly growing weak, Gobru falls unconscious. Just then the voice in his head notifies Gobru that he has once again completed the conditions to evolve, mindlessly accepting. Waking up on day 35, Gobru begins devouring the rest of the bear, gaining the skills, howl of the mountain lord, threatening glint and all tolerance, but stops himself, realizing that his weapons are suddenly so small. Upon returning the village, Gobmi scolds Gobru for being so reckless, but Gobji is more impressed that Gobru was able to defeat the crimson bear the master of the northern forest, only to evolve into an ogre. With everyone calming down, Gobmi and the redhead follow Gobru to their storage room, accidentally scaring the girls who seem to like how Gobru looks, but Gobmi seems jealous. Returning his beaten up axe to the blacksmith, Gobru is pleased to hear that the blacksmith had also crafted a knife for him, prompting Gobru to reward the blacksmith with a head pat, but Gobru does find it weird that Gobmi and the redhead are pinching him. Next Gobru hears that the sisters need some help, so Gobru says he'll ask three female goblins to help the sisters where needed, impressing Gobru as the girls seem to have integrated into their goblin society easily. Having a random thought, Gobru wonders if the sisters would love to be married one day, but upon seeing the sisters' flustered attitudes, the redhead and Gobmi smack Gobru out of jealousy. Heading elsewhere, Gobru greets the alchemist, spotting a vial of potion, curious as to what the alchemist intends to do with the poison. The alchemist admits that she had planned to use it as protection, 
but seeing as Gobru and the other goblins are friendly, the alchemist says she plans to dispose of it. Changing topics, the alchemist praises Gobru's new looks, getting excited and giddy when Gobru picks her up. Sadly, Gobru noticed the redhead and Gobmi glaring at him, ultimately forced to spend more time with the girls than he had anticipated. On day 36, Gobru continues to spar other goblins, but sadly his light punches would severely damage his fellow goblins, having easily shattered Gobkichi's armor. As Gobru begins healing the other goblins, Gobru spots Gobkichi storm off, wondering what happened. Later that day, Gobmi and Hobzato went to hunt together, Gob and other goblins began mining for rare stones, and the redhead had continued to hone her skills. As for Gobru, he's seen sewing something beside Hobsei, who's impressed Gobru is as still active even though his left arm had been devoured by the bear. Gobru asks Hobsei if she thinks Gobkichi will be fine, but Hobsei simply states that it's up to Gobkichi to catch up to Gobru. Changing topics, Gobru asks for his book back, but Hobsei simply ignores him. With day 37 arriving, Gobru continues with his morning training, but during lunch, Gob suddenly rushes to report that she had found a carbuncle severely injured. When Gobru tries to heal the carbuncle, he realizes that they need the help of the alchemist, to make up for all the blood lost. Later that day, the carbuncle wakes up, grateful to be saved by complete strangers, only to learn how she got here. The carbuncle reveals its name to be Returner, and was attacked by humans not too long ago, having such a rare stone on her head worth upwards of a billion gold. Desperate, Returner begs Gobru to chase off the adventurers pursuing her, as she herself is an ancient artifact created by the legendary mage, Velvet, whilst also being the guardian of her master's treasury. Returner utters that her core was damaged when the humans attacked, meaning access to the hidden treasury with sacred artifacts may be sealed forever. Returner states that she is willing to hand over the treasury to monsters rather than humans, which Gobru is pleased by, calling for everyone to gather around. Gobru declares that they'll all be heading towards the treasury, asking for the spirit stone knife the blacksmith had recently crafted, reassuring the human girls that they will try scaring the other human off before they resort to violence. With everyone making it to the golden treasury, Gobru orders everyone else to hide, whilst he tries to speak with the humans first. Sadly, the humans end up finding Gobru first, reasoning that they should slay the monsters in their way, and only then will they get their treasure. Spotting an invisible assassin approaching, Gobru nonchalantly blocks the assassin's strike, scolding the adventurers for attacking and robbing from the innocent. Refusing to listen to Gobru, the adventurers begin barraging Gobru with strikes, forcing Gobru to evade, detecting that there are three mages that are capable of high-quality magic. Gobru notices that the attack patterns of the adventures are sloppy, annoying Gobru, but this leaves him wide open to be hit by some lightning magic. Sadly the level 3 lightning spell doesn't damage Gobru, but having had enough, Gobru calls for the others to attack, ultimately stripping and devouring the adventurers. Gobru gains the jobs of an assassin, crusader, guardian, high wizard, priest and enchanter. Upon seeing the rare gear, Gobru chose to consume the gear as well, gaining status concealment and item box which allows Gobru to store up to 1200 items with 99 copies each. With the promise fulfilled, Returner leads Gobru to the Velvet's treasury where Gobru spots Velvet's corpse, learning that Velvet was skilled with spirit communication. Seeing as the Returner's life is coming to an end as well, Gobru chooses to consume the Returner's stone, gaining the skill Golden Order. As Gobkichi checks up on Go, the others begin moving the loot in the treasury into Gobru's item box, as for the corpse of Velvet, Gobru chose to cremate it. Surprisingly Velvet's corpse left behind a glove which Gobru equipped, being a substitute for his missing left arm. As the gang head home, Gobru decides to throw a party celebrating their gains so far, and throughout day 38, Gobru and the blacksmith inspect the various legendary items. On day 39, Gobru handed out items to the 15 other hobgoblins, personally keeping the Vermilion Spear, Kaziklu Bay, the Magic Bracelet, Solitary Fury and his already equipped, Silver Arm, totaling three legendary artifacts, the second highest ranking items. That afternoon, everyone worked together to hunt down and make bear stew, but Gobru is concerned that the red hair didn't help out. On day 40, Gobru decides to hold a tournament to rank the hobgoblins, on day 41 Gobru set out to slay the golden spider, 
devouring and learning the skills gold thread and golden spider show. Next was slaying the red deer with rose quartz antlers, but as Gobru explored the forest, he ran into a massive tree, realizing that the tree is home to dryads that seduce and suck the life force out of male species, something he learned from Gobji. Just then a dryad appears before him, beginning to press against and seduce Gobi, but seeing as he can't hold back his temptation, Gobru makes use of a skill, indulging in his temptations and satisfying the dryad. Afterwards, Gobru heads to a nearby waterfall to wash off, but runs into lizardmen, slaying and learning the skills aquatic life and lizardmen language. Gobru ended the day with slaying a bull, making use of his left arm. On day 42, Gobru had found out that two goblins were capable of magic, assigning Hobsay to teach the goblins, but gets scared seeing how happy Hobsay is. Moving on, Gobru learns enchantment magic from the blacksmith, but wonders why the blacksmith, Gobmi and the redhead are all mad at him. Shocked to see that the sisters are trying to poison him, Gobru learns from the alchemist that the girls are jealous, realizing that the dryad had left hickeys on his neck. Just then the alchemist leans in for a kiss, offering to do the deed with Gobru as well, but just then, Gobmi, the redhead and the other girls offer to join in as well, all whilst Gobkichi and Gob are kept outside with some golden threading. On day 44, Gobru reveals that his search skill has improved so much, able to detect and discern approaching enemies he's encountered before, heading outside to greet some cocky elves. When Gobru demands to know what the elves want, the elves begin arrogantly scolding Gobru for not being grateful, but Gobru knows that the elves are asking for help against the humans that are preparing to attack. With Gobji and Gobru hearing that the elves will reward the goblins for their help, Gobji notes how it isn't a bad deal, but suddenly Gobru declines. Gobru states that the elf better be more sincere when asking for help, but as one of the elves begins to draw his blade, Gobru unleashes his petrifying gaze, bringing the elves to their knees. Swiftly picking up the leader of the elves by the neck, Gobru demands the leader halt his hidden elves from firing any arrows, but out of nowhere Gobru manages to catch an incoming arrow with his jaw. Seeing Gobru pissed, the elf leader calls his men to cease fire but Gobru unveils his vermilion spear, stating that he's perfectly fine with teaming up. Stabbing the spear into the ground, Gobru conjures hundreds of spears that surround every elf within a 100-meter vicinity, something that ultimately scares the elves into retreating. On day 45, Gobru heads out to hunt 20 gray slimes, consuming them and obtaining the skills, physical attack resistance, auto-replication, fluid regeneration. Biting his finger, Gobru uses some blood to summon a mini-clone that allows him to see through and share senses, suddenly getting an idea. On day 46, Gobru asks the girls to create several pieces of clothing with Gobru's blood, this way Gobru will be alerted if anything happens to the girls, leading to day 47 where Gobru has spotted the elves returning using one of his clones. As the elves march towards the entrance of the goblin's cave, Gobru immediately activates his howl, once again freezing them in place only to bind the elves with his silk. Interrogating the elves inside the cave, Gobru notices that most of the elves are apologetic, having tried to stop the elf leader, but the elf leader continues to be cocky, stating that he intends to punish Gobru for the other day. Annoyed, Gobru states that the elf leader will be put to death, as for the remaining elves, Gobru gives them a chance to live if they can each defeat one of Gobru's goblins. Surprisingly, out of 23 elves, only 6 failed to pass, but Gobru had secretly fixed the matches to have 6 male elves fail, consuming the 6 elves only to gain Resident of Evergreen, Elemental, Knowledge of Archery, Tracking, Hiding. Sadly, Gobru announces that the remaining elves will have to surrender their weapons, stating that they will be kept as prisoners. When the elves voice how Gobru lied, Gobru reminds the elves that they tried attacking the goblins first, but spotting Gobji getting excited upon seeing so many female elves, Gobru reminds Gobji that no one is to touch the elves, but allows Gobji to at least satisfy himself. As Gobru finally slays the elves' leader, we cut to day 48 where Gobkichi has finally managed to solo a bear, reaching level 100, where he finally unveils his new body on day 49. With Gobru and Gobmi impressed, we learn that Gobkichi evolved into a special variant with dark red skin as a blessing from the demigod of flame and a thick layer of muscle as a blessing from the demigod of war. Gobkichi states that it's been a while since they both sparred, 
prompting both to head outside, both exchanging devastating blows with neither falling, but ultimately Gobru manages to outlast and topple Gobkichi. As Gobru and the others train all day, we see Gobru later that day stumbling through the cave, exhausted from sparring, only to spot a figure approaching. As the figure reaches out to give Gobru something, Gobru is suddenly seen waking up on day 51, dragged out of bed by Gob, learning that Gobkichi have inspired four new goblins to evolve into hobgoblins. The alchemist reveals that one of the hobgoblins can become a mage, whilst another can be a cleric, introducing Gobji, who promises to heal his fellow goblins. Gobru also notes how Hobsei has also evolved this morning, having grown into the Lord family as a half spell lord, but seeing Hobsei's markings, Gobru wonders if they are the same markings on his body as well. Excited, Hobsei states she wants to try out her new powers, heading outside only to begin conjuring multiple fireballs, simultaneously releasing multiple fireballs, Hobsei announces she could keep going, but seeing Hobsei has already destroyed the surrounding, Gobru asks that Hobsei hold back for now. Seeing as Hobsei is already a half spell lord, Gobru deduces that Hobsei will become a full spell lord by next evolution, so as a reward for evolving, Gobru suits Hobsei up with some equipment. Jealous, Hobzado promises to catch up, but at the same time, Gobru reasons that everyone's sudden evolution is because of a catalyst like himself, speculating that the environment goblins grow up in within the first month dictate their future, but knows that some goblins weren't as lucky as others. On day 52, Gobru and Gobkichi return from slaying a horse, running into some hobgoblins that declare they are leaving the village, having been replaced by more skilled younger goblins. Seeing the hobgoblins prepare to leave by force, Gobru defuses the situation, stating that he has nothing against the hobgoblins leaving since the hobgoblins haven't taken anything other than their own gear. As a parting gift, Gobru gives the goblins a mithril blade that can even harm Gobru, cutting to day 53 where Gobru had encountered a human being dragged along by an orc. Intervening, Gobru slays the orc, but consumes the human, learning the rare skill monster tamer. That night, Gobru meets with the alchemist, who unveils the product Gobru has been yearning for, alcohol. On day 54, Gobru reveals that various hobgoblins from the previous generation have left for their own journey, offering the remaining goblins to do the same, but upon seeing no one take the offer, we cut to day day 55 where Gobru is seen crafting earrings with his blood to help with communication. On day 56, Gobru began testing the communication earrings, choosing to make more, but on day 57 Gobru was amazed to hear that Gob managed to slay a tri-horned horse alone, but upon inspecting the horse, realized it was unconscious. Making use of his monster tamer skill, Gobru announces the horse as their first familiar, cutting to day 58 where Gobru is seen chasing a pack of black wolf with the help of his new pet bear, ending the day by taming the leader of the wolf pack and stationing it to protect the human girls. On day 59, Gobru was amazed to see the redhead manage to slay three cobbles all by herself, but as the two sit down to have a snack, the redhead is suddenly notified of a class change. Easily catching up and slaying a deer, the redhead reveals her new class, Noir Soldat, a class that forces the redhead to consume monsters often or she'll perish, but in exchange her rate of growth becomes exponential. That evening, Gobru learns from Gobji that more of his goblins have been attacked by humans, but this makes Gobru declare the war between humans and elves will begin soon, cutting to day 60, when Gobru is awoken, having detected multiple entities chasing hundreds of cobbles into their cave. Allowing the cobbles to take shelter for now, Gobru spots hundreds of skeletons chasing the cobbles, realizing that their arrows have no effect on the skeletons. With the horde of skeletons rushing towards them, Gobru manages to detect a powerful presence summoning the skeletons, but unable to focus on it, Gobkichi and Hobzado are forced to halt the incoming wave. Surprisingly, Hobzado manages to shatter several skeletons with ease, prompting Gobru to order his goblins to begin smashing through the hoarder. Equipping his spear, Gobru begins counting to ten, all whilst dismantling and making his way through the horde of skeletons, only to easily slay the leader. Consuming the skeleton's leader, Gobru gains the skills summon lower undead, high tier equipment materialization, mana absorption, low damage reduction, low magic reduction. Speaking with the kobolds, Gobru learns that kobold had dug into Velvet's treasury, accidentally awakening the greater skeleton, but had also chosen to lead the undeads towards the goblins' territory. 
Seeing the cobbled so thankful for the help, Gobru says he'll take care of the wounded, noting how he's gathered quite the crowd. With day 61 arriving, Gobru is seen hunting with Gobkichi, only to suddenly spot 12 armed humans dash past them. Upon secretly following them, Gobru learns that the humans plan to kidnap the chief of the elves daughter as they return from a festival, and that one of the elves had purposely given the humans the information. With two hours passing and the sun setting, the elves appear just as the humans had predicted, but the elven daughter catches Gobru's eyes. In an instant the humans barrage the elves with arrows, moving in close to finish off any surviving elves, only to capture an elven daughter. Having seen enough, Gobru reveals himself, easily tying up the humans with his silk, only to apologize to the fallen elves for not acting sooner. On day 62, Gobru interrogates the humans, learning that the humans plan to invade within 20 days, but after consuming the 12 humans Gobru learns several new striking skills along with more types of resistance. With several hours passing by, the elven daughter finally awakes, demanding to know where she is, but Goburu can't help but notice her wings. When the elven daughter wonders if Goburu will do naughty things with her, Goburu ignores her, instead offering her some tea and explaining the situation. The elven daughter scolds Goburu for sitting by and watching her comrades be slayed, pushing the elf back. Goburu reiterates that they don't plan to fight alongside either the elves or humans. Gobru also reveals that there is a traitor that assisted the humans with attacking the elven daughter, but seeing the elven girl break down crying, Gobru reasons she should rest for now, and he'll send her home tomorrow. That night, Gobji wonders if he can play with the elf, but Gobru refuses to allow such things. On day 63, Gobru, Gobkichi and the elf begin heading towards her elven village, wondering why the elf has wings, only to learn that higher elves normally hide said wings in their body. Apparently when normal elves level up they sprout wings to fly, but not being used to her wings, the elf can't control her wings yet. With several hours passing by, the gang finally reaches the elves' village, but immediately Gobru sends 25 elves in the trees, all preparing to fire. Intervening, the elven girl cries for everyone to pause, instead taking Gobru and Gobkichi to meet her father, the chief of the village, who is grateful to Gobru for saving her daughter's life. Gobru clears up the situation, stating that he didn't save the chief's daughter expecting anything, but the chief still insists that he reward Gobru. Taking out a special item, the chief unveils the Failnot, an ancient class item that has been passed down their family for years. Seeing the chief genuinely grateful for Gobru saving his daughter's life, Gobru states that he's willing to give the chief some information on the humans, ultimately leading to Gobru befriending the chief as the chief gifted Gobru with several mithril items in exchange for spirit stone knives and magical items. As Gobru prepares to leave, the chief asks if Gobru had seen their army of 20 that left their village not too long ago, but not wanting to sour their new relationship, Gobru lies, saying he hasn't encountered any elves. As a final parting gift, the chief gives Gobru some of their elven medicine and liquor, something Gobru is very grateful for, savoring the delectable taste for the liquor that night. On day 64, Gobru wakes up, asking for Gobmi to wake up as well, but is surprised to see Gobmi has evolved into a Dampir variant, along with eight other goblins evolving into hobgoblins. Gobru instructs Gobmi to keep her glasses on, having received a blessing from the god of ice along with evil eyes that can charm anyone she glares at. Gobru notes how her ice affinity offsets her weakness to sunlight as a vampire, but seeing her new form, Gobru can't help but feel she reminds him of someone. On top of things, Gob had evolved into a half-earth lord, able to now mine through bedrock, fortify her body and has lighting magic for detecting gems. Hobzato also reveals her new half-blood lord evolution, able to manipulate and use her blood as weapons, but as Gobru observes the girls, Gobru notices that they all have acquired tattoos, wondering if the tattoos mean anything. Needing new names, Gobji renames Hobse to Spelse, Gobmi to Dami, Hobzato to Bloodsato, Gob to Earth, Gobkichi to Ogrekichi, Gobji to Hobji and Gobru is now Ogru. Having established a ranking for everyone's race, Ogru knows that once the human and elf war starts, the elves will surely seek their help, therefore Ogru plans to prepare everyone for combat. Upon giving the cobbled's earring devices, Ogru gets annoyed at the female elves for being so reserved, choosing to infuse them with more confidence first. As Ogru begins training the elves and cobbled's, 
Ogru chooses to summon undeads to help with sparring, choosing to equip the skeletons with more heavy-duty armor. As the elves begin to integrate to the goblin's way of life, we cut to day 65 Ogru figures out he can summon regular skeletons, zombies and undeads. Ogru also confirms he can't devour and steal the skills of Ghost, and that the undeads easily burn up in sunlight, but as their population expands over 100, Ogru wonders how he can get the cobbles to grow faster. As Ogru worriedly watch Gobfu devour the flesh of undeads, we cut to day 66, where Ogru and several others are visiting the caves where the cobbles reside. As the cobbles gather their stuff, Earth takes over, sealing the cobbles' homes for good, only for Ogru to order the cobbles to begin hunting down wolves, in order to tame more familiars. Surprisingly, the cobbles manage to tame 20 new wolves, but sadly no pack leader. As the gang return home, Earth runs into a stamp boar, excitedly charging at it, but Earth accidentally beats the boar to a pulp. That night, the blacksmith unveils Ogru's newly modified axe, having infused it with all four elemental spirit stones. As Gobru rewards the blacksmith that night, we cut to day 67 where Ogru has assigned the cobbles to continue hunting, only to have a private chat with Ogrekichi, not surprised that Ogrekichi has feelings for Earth. Ogrekichi admits that he can't hold back anymore, asking Ogru for advice, but Ogru simply orders Ogrekichi to confess his feelings tonight. With the full moon in the night sky, Ogrekichi finally musters up the courage to confess his feelings for Earth, who surprisingly accepts Ogrekichi's confession, both embracing. On day 68, Ogru is surprised at how fast Ogrekichi is, happy that Ogrekichi's confession went well, but Ogru secretly reveals that he had Dami help smooth things out for Ogrekichi to confess. Upon confirming that Earth is okay from last night with Ogrekichi, Ogru had Ogrekichi spar with one of his undead summons, only for Ogru and the gang to head out to slay stronger monsters. Upon consuming the monsters, Ogru tries out his new exoskeleton skill, suddenly encasing himself in some tough armor, something that can easily block incoming strikes. Seeing as the armor is too fancy, Ogru unequips it, but also takes the chance to try out his new flight ability, Sprouting Wings. Finishing off the day with some stamp boar soup, we cut to day 69 where Ogru starts the day by sparring with the redhead, happy that she's making progress. Next Ogru visits the blacksmith, happy to see the elves, Karu and Uru, are enjoying working for the blacksmith. With the blacksmith and elves working together, they manage to craft a superior crossbow, but that evening, Ogru visits the sisters, learning that they obtained the class, head cook. As Ogru finishes up having the sisters recreate meals from his past life, Ogru visits the alchemist, amazed that the alchemist has produced nails from black skeleton bones that freeze enemies that are struck. As the alchemist makes her advances on Ogru, the other girls join in, leading to day 70, where the elves are visiting to report some news to Ogru. Thanks to the earrings, the elves Ogru captured are disguised as dark elves, but Ogru learns that the humans are finally making their move, as the elf representative proposes an agreement, asking Ogru to slay all the humans. Ogru gladly accepts, handing the elf a device that'll allow Ogru to communicate with the chief. As the elves leave, Ogru gets excited, deeming his army the Parabellum mercenaries, only to order everyone to prepare for war. On day 71, Ogru and his Parabellum mercenaries begin heading out, revealing that they've gathered 36 members, but with Spelsay's help, they've managed to expand to 73 members with the help of familiars. With everyone arriving early to the humans' camp, Ogru spots a magical barrier, noting how the barrier is meant to keep out lower-level monsters than the barrier's human spellcaster. Ordering everyone to surround the barrier, Ogru initiates the battle, infusing his silver arm with a magical spell, converting his arm into a crossbow only to penetrate the barrier with a single projectile. Following up, Earth created Earth Walls only for Hobse and Dami to shoot fire and ice spells, all whilst Ogru summoned his hoarder of skeletons whilst firing several more rounds from his arm. As the battle ensued, Ogru was surprised spotting several humans alive, spotting the human leader. As Ogru makes himself well known, the humans spot Ogru, all turning their attention to Ogru. First one of the human mages carves a path for the frontline humans, next the leader of the humans is enchanted with a speed and barrier spell, rushing through the army of skeletons, but unfortunately Ogru simply repels the leader as she strikes. As Ogru compliments the leader's fire spirit, 
The leader simply demands Ogru to defeat her before acting so close, but seeing as it's an interesting proposal, Ogru gets off his familiar, ordering his army to slay everyone but the Lady Knight, the Sorcerer, the Priestess and the Flame Swordsman. As the leader charges up a powerful strike, Ogru sadly reports that his army is simply too overwhelming, spotting Ogrekichi nonchalantly carving through the humans. Dami enchant and have the humans turn on each other with her charming eye, Bloodsato use the blood to of the humans to collect more souls and Earth manhandle the remaining humans. Back with Ogru, the Lady Knight managed to reach him with her ignited blade, but sadly her blade is unable to pierce his thick skin, out of nowhere a dragon spell is casted, with the caster asking for their leader to run. Sadly, since the Lady Knight refuses to flee, the caster is forced to release the level 5 dragon spell, onto both the leader and Ogru. Not wanting the Lady Knight to die, Ogru flips the leader around, turning his back to block the spell, only to cast three simultaneous barriers, along with a vacuum and water projectiles, completely neutralize the powerful dragon spell. With Ogru's army suffering no casualties, Ogru obtains many skills from the corpses, only to cut to later that day where the elven leader is visiting to celebrate and thank Ogru for protecting them against the humans. As everyone celebrates, Ogru sneaks off to check on the humans, spotting the two human women writhing in pain, finally giving in and embracing Ogru as they cry for help. On day 72, Ogru equips his earrings onto the girls that force them to tell the truth, only to begin interrogating them, sharing information on the humans with the elven leader and revealing that the humans plan to attack the elves from multiple directions. On day 73, Ogru and his army waited for the next human army to approach the elven territory, meticulously hiding with preset traps, only to spot an army of 500 humans with 100 wizards among their ranks. Giving the signal, Ogru's army traps the human army with falling trees, only to crush and slay 200 of the humans with some falling boulders. A little more time went by and Ogru's firing squadron ended up whittling down the humans down to 100, prompting the remaining men to create a circle, choosing to bunker down. Spotting the remaining leader of the humans, Ogru's orders his army to continue blasting the bunker, all whilst Ogrekichi is ordered to capture the human's leader. Using their overwhelming army to outwit the remaining men, Ogrekichi manages to find the leader, isolating him only to overpower him. Ogru earns more skills from the corpses, but at that moment, Dami shyly utters that all the fighting had got her worked up, asking Ogru if she can have his baby. On day 74, the captured humans grow annoyed that they've been embarrassed, having been tamed with collars around their necks, but having heard enough the redhead man orders the cocky men to quiet down. Having interrogated the redhead man, Ogru learns that the human versus elf wars started due to the first princess of the human kingdom, Sternberg, suddenly contracted a fatal disease. The princess was also married to the future emperor of the neighboring empire Kilika, someone who knew of the elven medicine that was said to cure all illnesses, and hence the humans declared war on the elves, hoping to find said cure to heal their weakened princess. As Ogru wonders what his next move should be, we cut to Earth who has accidentally uncovered a heated water source, giving Ogru an idea. Getting to work, Ogru unveils his newly created hot spring. As Ogru, Gobji, Earth, Gobkichi enjoy the bath, we see that the girls have begun scrubbing each other's back, each complimenting the other's fair skin. On day 75, Ogru decided to have the humans begin training with his army assigning Dami and Spelse with their own armies for a mock battle, but as for Blood Sato and Ogrekichi, they fail to grasp simple concepts for warfare and are forced to sit the mock battles out. At the same time, the redhead man manages to outspar Ogru's summons, demanding that he get to spar with Ogru himself. Impressed, Ogru gives the redhead a physical boost, accepting the redhead's challenge, but still easily overwhelms the man. As Ogru heals the redhead, Ogrekichi offers to spar as well, impressing everyone as the redhead and Ogrekichi both get fired up the longer the battle draws on. Sitting down for a meal, the redhead man reveals that he is very used to speaking with demi-humans, preferring the demi-humans more than humans. Hearing that the redhead man is impressed with how Ogru united everyone, Ogru is impressed to hear that the redhead man wants to work for Ogru moves forward, prompting Ogru to remove the man's collar, and assigning him to train the redhead girl. On day 77, some of the humans Ogru captured refuses to participate in training, hence the elves offer to watch over them instead. Seeing as it's the perfect chance, Ogru asks the elven leaders about this almighty medicine that the elves have, 
but Ogru was shocked to hear that the elven leader had given Ogru the medicine as a reward for saving his daughter the first time they met. Taking out the medicine, Ogru drinks the potion, obtaining the skill of quick regeneration, blood of panacea. Upon giving one of the captured humans a drop of his blood, everyone is shocked to see the human completely regenerate all wounds, making Ogru wonder how strong he has truly become. As their third interaction with the human army arrives, Ogru is seen tossing his spear, instantly slaying the human captain, only to conjure hundreds of spears to kill off a good chunk of the humans. As Ogru's mercenaries rush in to clean up the rest of the humans, Ogru produces an ooze to consume the human corpses, cutting to day 82, where Ogru is visiting the elven leader. As the elven leader serves up a feast, he thanks Ogru once again for decimating the human armies, but reiterates how he doesn't want any unnecessary bloodshed, therefore the elven leader plans to give Ogru their greatest elven warriors to ensure their next battle with the humans will end the war. With Ogru listening to what the elven leader has planned, Ogru, the redhead and the female knight ride back on familiars, but the knight takes the chance to request that Ogru at least help cure the sick princess, reasoning that Ogru can save a life and have the kingdom owe him a favor. Although it doesn't sound like a bad plan, Ogru knows that human society worships the five great gods, but seeing as Ogru is blessed by the god of demise and origin, he knows he won't be welcome. Thinking for a bit, Ogru comes up with an alternative solution, cutting to day 83, where Ogru's final standoff against the remaining 2,000 humans has arrived. With extra troops from the elves, Ogru's army totals 650, meaning Ogru is completely outnumbered. Additionally, one of Ogru's blood clones had overheard Rugal Orden assisting the humans, someone Ogru learns is one of the eight heroic braves that have been blessed by the gods. Ogru learns that the braves have the ability to grow stronger the larger their armies are, getting Ogru excited as he begins his attack with his skeleton summons, something Dami doesn't think is the best idea since it's almost daybreak. Ogru reassures everyone that he's already factored that in, ordering Ogrekichi and the others to carve a path for Ogru and his skeletons to invade the center. With the skeletons making contact with humans, the humans intentionally draw out the fight, allowing for the sun to rise, burning the skeletons alive. Luckily, Ogru had equipped his skeletons with a blood coating, allowing them to overwhelm the humans, giving Ogru enough time to finally appear. Ordering his skeletons to retreat, Ogru begins charging up a powerful water and blood spell, all whilst a brave is escorted to the Ogru's position. As Ogru completely decimates the surrounding humans, he begins devouring the corpses of the humans, only for the mysterious brave to appear, asking to duel Ogru. Ogru deduces that the brave standing before him must be Rubald Orden, Filippo the Bonebug Brave, impressing Filippo as he didn't think he was so famous, but Ogru gets weirded out by Filippo's demonic bug-like glare. Filippo begins complaining that Ogru has been causing trouble for him, but Ogru knows that Filippo is so carefree because he is very powerful, even refusing to share what he's blessed with when Filippo asks. Unveiling some bugs he's deemed Undero, Filippo tosses the bugs onto the human corpses, causing the human corpses to suddenly spring to life, but Ogru knows they aren't undead. Seeing as Filippo has sort of parasitic skill, Filippo reveals the difference between heroes and braves is that heroes are more individually strong whereas braves get stronger the larger their armies are. Unleashing his Undero Bezala Undead Insect Legion skill, Ogru watches as the human corpses transform into insects, all swarming Ogru, but Ogru manages to easily defend. Impressed, Filippo chooses to take control of the bugs, but Ogru still manages to defend, forcing Filippo to unveil his giant centipede, Altile, that catches Ogru off guard. As Filippo jumps with joy, he reveals that Altalum is considered a natural disaster, with potent poison able to paralyze its target. As Ogru slowly begins to fall unconscious, Dami suddenly senses Ogru's presence fading, but unfortunately no one can assist Ogru at the moment. With Filippo pitying Ogru's corpse, Filippo sends Altalum away, wondering how he'll dissect Ogru, but suddenly Ogru's corpse disappears. Sensing killing intent, Filippo manages to evade Ogru's surprise attack, deducing that the ogre he killed must have been Ogru's clone. With Ogru refusing to confirm or deny, Filippo takes out one of his secret weapons, but first introduces himself as Filippo Bird Lockarda, ranked 7th in the country. Before Filippo can say anything else, Ogru strikes Filippo with his lightning axe, destroying Filippo's first secret weapon, 
but this forces Filippo to unveil his second secret weapon. With tentacles protruding from his chest, Filippo punctures some of his bugs, absorbing and transforming into a bug himself, pumping Ogru up as he wants to devour Filippo's skills. As Filippo dashes forward, Ogru severs Filippo's tentacles, forcing Filippo into the air, but Ogru replies by tossing a lighting projectile, that Filippo barely dodges. Filippo notes how amazing Ogru is even though Ogru hasn't undergone epic awakening, but refuses to elaborate further, annoying Ogru. Ogru smirks, stating that he'll force the information out of Filippo, but first Ogru equips his insect exoskeleton along with his wings, dashing towards Filippo. As Ogru easily outmaneuvers Filippo in the air, we see Ogru's party have finished up slaying the group of humans on their end, but Dami can't help but feel uneasy, rushing towards Ogru's position. With Ogru declaring that Filippo is defeated, Filippo chuckles, crawling naked out of his bug suit, only to sprint off. When Ogru tries to give chase, he's forced to deal with Filippo's mindless bug suit, pissed that Filippo successfully escaped. With Dami arriving, she's relieved that Ogru is alright, but Ogru revealed that he had another plan all along. Having one of his clones run through the forest with his stealth skill, Ogru managed to find the base of the human leaders, housing the future king. Ogru had his clone give a replica of the elven medicine and in exchange the humans agreed to retreat. With the war over, Ogru admits that he could have easily killed the future king then and there, but knows that would have caused years of unnecessarily bloodshed between humans and elves. As Ogru orders all of the injured to be healed, he allows any knights that survive to return home, but knows he must first take care of something. Having learnt of six hobgoblins, two hobgoblin mages, eight goblins, ten cobbles and four elves passing during the war, Ogru and the others give them a proper memorial, promising to avoid future conflict where necessary, and promising to grow stronger to ensure no more lives are taken. On day 84, Ogru wakes up to the terrifying aura of Hobfu, learning that Hobfu had been watching over Ogru all night, weirding Ogru out. Looking around, Ogru is impressed to see Hobji has evolved into a half-saint lord and has been tasked with healing the injured from the war. Ogru is also amazed that Hobji had obtained a light barrier skill, complementary of the half-saint class, able to withstand 20 of Ogru's basic punches. Weirdly, Hobfu continues to praise and admire Hobji's evolution, even though she had evolved into a ghoul, especially devouring all the corpses during the war. With Hobfu admiring the rivalry between Ogru and Ogrekichi, Ogru chooses to ignore Hobfu for now, but suddenly runs into Hobmi, frightened by her new set of eyes. Apologizing for scaring Ogru, Hobmi states that she still isn't used to controlling her new eyes, having evolved into a Dodonki, a class that excels in combat with illusionary magic. Hearing that Hobmi has the skills remote viewing and interscopy, Ogru admits that Hobmi will be able to outclass him in terms of information gathering. Seeing as more goblins have evolved, Gobji has given Hobfu the name Gufu, Hobmi the name Dodom and Hobji the name Seiji. Additionally, Ogru learnt that seven more hobgoblins had evolved into ogres, amazed that his goblins are mourning their fallen brethren, and are evolving to prevent more goblins' lives from being taken. Checking out the cobbles, Ogru is impressed to see six new fleet-foot cobbles, shocked to see the leader of the kobold evolve into a warrior kobold, something that resembles a cocky human, but with the evolution comes the name Akakazi no Suji. Gabji explains that a true name is a way for enemies to cast curse on enemies, meaning it would be best to conceal one's true names, but seeing as the kobold leader's name is too long, Ogru agrees to call him Akita. Wondering what he should do with the prisoners, Ogru calls a meeting for all the prisoners, informing everyone that they may leave whenever, but if they choose to stay they must follow Ogru's orders. Hearing this, several prisoners begin arrogantly declaring that they should be treated with respect, especially because they are stronger than some measly goblins. Ogru declares he could care less how strong they are, as Ogru would trust his goblin brethren to overcome random prisoners he saved. Offended, the prisoners demand to fight Dami for leader of the mercenary, but the prisoners get more cocky realizing that Ogru is the leader of the clan. With Dami holding back her anger, Ogru agrees too to duel, prompting two of the prisoners to equip their flame orb and gale orb. As the two prisoners fuse their attacks, Ogru notes how orb weapons boost one's stats and can repair themselves when damaged, giving Ogru the signal to decimate the two without fear of harming them. With Seiji healing the prisoners, 
Ogru continues to pummel the other prisoners, but is caught off guard when one of the gorilla-like prisoners tackle Ogru. As the gorilla declares that he'll be leader from now on, Ogru dashes forward, easily incapacitating the gorilla, but praises the gorilla for a smart sneak attack. Realizing that the half dampier prisoner is missing, Ogru gets pissed, spotting the prisoner flirting with Dami, instantly pummeling the prisoner, only to give the poor soul his blood. Luckily, Ogru is happy to see the remaining prisoners are less violent, having a respect for Ogru, as Ogru did free them from their captives. Before Ogru can leave, the half dampier gets on his knees, praising Ogru for his sweet blood, weirding Ogru out as he now resembles Gufu. Visiting the blacksmith, Ogru introduces several dwarves, but the dwarves immediately begin criticizing the blacksmith's work. Heading elsewhere, Ogru begins testing out his new synthesis skill, able to infuse an orb onto his leg to create new armor. Testing out the chaos of the dead skill, Ogru succeeded in summoning a legion monster, but had to put it down when it went rampant. Ogru even tried combining light and sunlight weaknesses, shocked to see the exponential effects when combining two weaknesses. With all the girls listening to Ogru's adventures, we cut to day 85, where Ogru and Earth are working to reconstruct the underground hot spring, hoping to one day open it up to the elves as well. On day 86, Ogru continues to train the provisional recruits, testing his synthesis skills on them to help train them. On day 87, Ogru was handed a warhammer crafted by the dwarves, happy to see the dwarves really appreciate Ogru giving them a new home. That evening, Ogru heads out into the forest, shocked to see that his mere presence scares off nearby monsters, but isn't too surprised to see that the dryad had found him, forced to spend the day with her to satisfy her. Upon returning home, the girls found out that Ogru had been spending time with another girl, forced to satisfy the girls all throughout the evening. On day 88, Ogru spends time planting new crops, having been handed a special type of magical seeds for fruit and vegetables. As Ogru and the others work hard throughout the day, they wave goodbye to some of their provisional members on day 89, having all decided to head home. On top of things, Ogru had decided to release the knights they captured, but Dami had made sure to charm them all with her eyes, meaning they now have spies within the human ranks. With Ogru learning that the humans have indeed retreated, the elven leader invites Ogru and his members to the Lutrolf banquet, prompting the elves to entertain and put on a show. Ogru wonders if the elves should really be sharing such a sacred festival with outsiders, the elven leader reassures Ogru that sharing this tradition with a friend is the least they could do. The elven leader also reveals that he had a younger brother that sought connections with the outside world, but sadly the elven leader has yet to hear back from him, but is grateful to Ogru for creating a community where his younger brother would be proud to return to. On day 90, Earth had reported that she had dug up the rest of the spirit stone, left behind by Velvet and Returner. As a sign of gratitude, Ogru chooses to consume the spirit stone, obtaining various gravity magic and spatial resistances. That evening, Ogru makes use of some black skeleton corpses, fusing them with anti-sunlight magic, in order to create a skeleton centipede. Ogru states that he'll be using the centipede as a ride, to take the girls back to their human town, making the girls fear that Ogru dislikes them, but Ogru reminds the girls he had promised the girls their freedom a long time ago. On day 91, Ogru proudly presents his new hot spring facility, allowing more of the citizens to leave, but at the same time the redhead gets scolded by her teacher for not focusing, but is relieved to hear Ogru still prefers to have the girls around. As Ogru spends day 92 with the girls, we cut to day 93, where Ogru holds a welcome party for his new members, but heads over to chat with some of the members that remind Ogru that humans in the kingdom and empire, despise demi-humans and that Ogru will need a guarantor from a noble family. Day 94 marks their preparation for departure day, Ogru announces that they'll split into groups, ordering everyone to gather as much intel as possible, that everyone try to defeat the enemies they encounter, that they all try to level up and most importantly that everyone try to stay alive. With day 95 arriving, everyone is gathered outside, with several people nervous and excited. As Ogru gives his final remarks to his rival Ogrekichi, everyone now splits up, prompting Ogru to admit that he was happy to have learned so much in the forest, but now he'll be heading off to visit the human girl's hometown, the garrison city of Treant. Check out one of our other videos on the screen or in the info card above. Subscribe, like and comment.